Our skin takes a lot of abuse as it protects us from the outside world. What happens when it has problems? Lumps, bumps, and barnacles, what's growing on my skin? Tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. I'm Dr. Kelly Evans, your Prairie Doc tonight. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. Multiple choice. The most common skin cancer is A, squamous cell carcinoma, B, malignant melanoma, or C, basal cell carcinoma. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of Dr. Holmes' essays, originally written for this show, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We answer your questions about skin issues as they are called into us or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight is my friend, Dr. Mandy Greenway of the Avera Medical Group Dermatology in Mitchell, South Dakota. Welcome, Mandy, and thank you for coming all the way from Mitchell today. Absolutely, thanks for having me. Um, Mandy and I were medical school classmates. Mandy married my husband and I. She got <laughs> ordained just for that reason. So we were, I'm really excited to have her here. <laughs> I am excited to be here. Um, what, should we start by discussing skin cancer, the elephant in the room? You Absolutely. brought some pictures. That's probably one of the big things that you see in a general dermatology clinic. Absolutely, and that's one of the big things I want to get across. My, my passion, I, I have a lot of things I like about dermatology, but my passion is in preventing and treating skin cancer. So I, I want everyone to know what it looks like, what to look for, and, and what you should do if you see something like this. So yeah, I did bring along some pictures um, to kind of show you what we're dealing with here. So am I, am I supposed to give away the, the correct <laughs> answer here yet? So this um, first picture here, so this is a type of skin cancer called basal cell. So there are a couple different ways that this can show up. Um, this one in particular is what's called a superficial basal cell. So this often looks like a, a red scaly patch. So From here it doesn't really look like too much actually. Absolutely, yeah. so mm -hmm. people often will let these grow for a long time because they think it's just, you know, they scrape their skin or they have a little patch of eczema or something like that. Anything that just keeps getting bigger, doesn't want to heal, doesn't go away, should be looked at. So this one gets missed a lot until it's often quite large. Mm -hmm. This next one, so this is when it starts getting a little bit thicker. So this is what we would call um, a kind of a superficial going into a nodular basal cell. What I want you to see in this one is that at the edges, it almost looks kind of shiny. And even in the picture, you can see it where it looks what I describe as pearly. So we often see this, if you shine a light across it, it looks really shiny and pearly. And, mm -hmm. and that's a good sign that there could be something going on here. Mm -hmm. And basal, so when we introduce those types of skin cancer at the beginning of the show, mm -hmm. basal cell, squamous cell, melanoma, these all refer to the types of cells that are overgrowing correct. and growing out of control, correct? Correct, mm -hmm. yes. So basal cells is the basal layer of the epidermis. Mm -hmm. So the top of our skin is the epidermis. The bottom of that, the lower level, is the basal cell. So mm -hmm. that's what overgrows in basal cells, mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, accordingly, squamous cell and melanoma um, yeah. as we go. Mm -hmm. This next one, mm -hmm. um, you can see, this is when it starts to get a little bit bigger and more nodular. Um, it, I always get asked, you know, do you really have patients come in with ones this size every day? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's amazing what we are able to, to play off and ignore yeah. on our skin over time. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's a good example of a, a bigger basal cell. Can you talk about how these might be treated? So what's treatment yeah. for a basal cell carcinoma? So it depends on how big it is and in what kind of depth it is. So mm -hmm. when the first picture I showed with that superficial basal mm -hmm. cell, that we have a lot more options. You know, mm -hmm. we can just kind of scrape the top layers of the skin off. Mm -hmm. um, there's also even some creams that we can use to treat those. So those, luckily, we don't have to do a, a big surgical procedure. Mm -hmm. 
as they get bigger, then we have to actually cut out the skin mm -hmm. and stitch it up mm -hmm. um, on areas of our body that have more skin to give us, you mm -hmm. know, our, our arms, our legs, our right. chest, our back. That's easy to do in the clinic, but once they start getting bigger or if they're certainly on the face, you know, on yeah, the nose, on the eyelids. that you just show yeah. us, that looks like a challenging cancer Absolutely. to remove. Yeah. So then we talk about things like Mohs surgery, mm -hmm. which is a special type of surgery done by a, a board certified dermatologist that did a fellowship mm -hmm. in, in Mohs surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, after that, I want to show this one in particular. So this, this is a type of basal cell called infiltrative basal cell. This is another one that often sneaks by. So it, it looks, like, looks a, like a scar. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. That's what everyone says. And and I I've missed ones in my clinic where I say, you know, is, is this a scar? Did you have something removed mm -hmm. here? And and they often don't know. And so we'll biopsy it. And and these ones in particular, they're kind of like an iceberg. I like to tell patients, mm -hmm. you know, what we see on the surface is very little amount of what's actually there. So mm -hmm. once we start doing the biopsy and look deeper, we're often very surprised at how large these ones can get. Mm -hmm. Then the next most common skin cancer um, is something called squamous cell. So squamous cell, again, mm -hmm. like you said, it's it's a cancer of actually the, the upper layers of the epidermis, the mm -hmm. top of the skin. These can grow a little bit bigger. Um, they often look like red bumps, scaly. Um, mm -hmm. They often will bleed and they can hurt. Mm -hmm. That's usually what I have people say, mm -hmm. you know, they thought it was a bug bite or thought it was a pimple, but it just won't go away, won't yeah. go away, won't go away. So. Right. These are some ways they can show up. So this is one on the top of the ear. This is one on the nose. This is a special type of a squamous cell called a keratoacanthoma. Mm -hmm. These can often grow very quickly. So I, I have patients that will say that this literally grew to the size in a week or two. Mm -hmm. So that can happen. The next type of skin cancer I want to talk about is, is melanoma. So this mm -hmm. is actually a, t a type of melanoma called lentigo maligna. Mm -hmm. um, it's a special type of, of melanoma in situ that shows up on on the um, sun damaged areas of the skin. So usually I see these in my 70, 80 year old patients that have been out in the sun for a long mm -hmm. time, um, or people that have you know spent a lot of time in their sun. So farmers, fishermen, sure. that sort of thing. So. These grow very, very slowly. They can grow over 20 years wow. before they ever become invasive. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of patients that'll say, oh, well, that's just my freckle. I've had it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I say, you could be right. <laughs> you, right. you might have had it for 10 years, but it's mm -hmm. not normal. We gotta yeah. get rid of it. So. Yeah. This is um, another type of melanoma. So this is once it actually starts invading. So this mm -hmm. is a superficial spreading melanoma. Mm -hmm. So this is one that's actually growing into the skin. Um, and again, we need to get these out. I'm just gonna show a few other ones. So these are some other areas they can show up. And when we're talking about melanoma, I mean, we all have moles. What what gives you more suspicion that this mm -hmm. is something that we should be concerned about on some of those, like the first two pictures that you showed Absolutely. us? Yeah. So the things um, that we tell kind of general public are the, are the A, B, C, D, E's mm -hmm. of melanoma. So A is asymmetry. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell patients if you take in any of your moles and you cut it in half in any direction, mm -hmm. it should be the same from side to side. Yeah. Um, B is for border. So again, it should have a nice smooth border. If you start getting lots of, you know, jagged edges, that's not a good sign. Mm -hmm. Color. So people often worry about dark moles. Mm -hmm. I worry more about moles that have lots of different colors. So sure. a perfectly round, small, dark mole isn't likely to worry me. Mm -hmm. It's the ones that have dark and light and red and blue yeah. <laughs> and black. Mm -hmm. um, D is for diameter. So some people just make larger moles, but yeah. in general, if you have lots of small moles and you have a mole that's over six millimeters, so that's about a, like a pencil eraser size, mm -hmm. that should raise the suspicion, should okay. be looked at. But the most important thing is the E, the evolution. So mm -hmm. what is it doing over time? You know, I mean, if this was this mole was half the size a month ago, mm -hmm. it's not a good thing. It needs to be checked out. So yeah. that's, that's what people generally look for. You know, yeah. that's what brings them into my clinic. Then I, I look for different things as well. Mm -hmm. One of the big things is, again, the ugly duckling. So what doesn't fit on your skin? So right. a lot of people come in and they just want to show me, you know, one mole, one spot here, one spot there. And mm -hmm. I really kind of push them to let me look at their whole skin because it does tell me what their breed of moles looks like. Mm. Um, and if they have all, you know, big kind of speckled light brown moles that might look dangerous if you just look at one, but now they've got a little small, really dark one that's more concerning to me. So yeah. what doesn't fit on your body? Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Thanks. I was gonna show, so these are some more pictures of melanoma, but again, every time you see them, you're gonna see, um, there's a good example. I mean, that one's 
pretty obvious. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not symmetrical, it has weird borders, it has lots of different shapes, mm -hmm. um, and it's obviously quite large. So yeah. that's a good example of a melanoma. Good. So those are the, the sort of the, the three skin cancers that you co you commonly see. Absolutely. How so? You mentioned how basal cells are treated. Are squamous mm -hmm. cells and melanomas treated differently? They are a little bit. Mm -hmm. So squamous cells do tend to, um, even though it's not common, they can metastasize and they can spread to other areas of the body. Mm -hmm. So they just we consider them a little bit more aggressive. Mm -hmm. So we jumped to you know surgery a little bit quicker, and mm -hmm. again that mo surgery like we talked about. Mm -hmm. But in general, if it's a small spot, we treat it very similarly to basal cell. Sure. Whereas basal cell almost never metastasizes. Correct. correct. Yeah. yeah. It can, but it's very, very, very rare. Yeah. But it, it mm -hmm. is possible. Mm -hmm. Um, melanoma is a little bit different. So melanoma, we just know it doesn't take a whole lot of, of depth and size of that melanoma to really make it mm -hmm. a lot more dangerous. So yeah. those we remove with you know wider margins. We take more of the skin out, mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes we even do things like you know look at their lymph node, do lymph node biopsies, yeah. do imaging of them, um, depending so really on just, size and depth exactly. that you find under the microscope. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Good. Um, well, we're starting to get some viewer questions, so why don't we address those, steering away from skin cancer for a little bit. Our first viewer asks, what is the best systemic option for lichen planus if it's in several areas? So can you just touch on for our viewers who probably don't know what lichen planus is, what, what kind of condition is this, and, and sure. what are treatment options? So lichen planus is an inflammatory condition, um, kind of like if I would say you have eczema or psoriasis, those are more common ones that we mm -hmm. think of. Um, we don't often know why it shows up, so sometimes we can have it as a result of a medication that we're on, um, and that's called a lichenoid drug eruption, so that's a little bit different. So whenever I see a patient with lichen planus, um, it usually shows up as lots of small, really itchy purple bumps everywhere, mm -hmm. and they're often very itchy. Um, can also affect your mouth and different mucous membranes, so including mm -hmm. the genitals. Mm -hmm. The first thing I do is I make sure I, you know, there's not a medication culprit because mm -hmm. if that's the case, that's the easiest thing to do is stop sure. that medication. Mm -hmm. um, then if it's it just in a small area, we start with topical treatment, so things you just put on your skin, so mm -hmm. things like topical steroids, like cortisone, but stronger. Mm -hmm. um, and then if it is in lots of areas, then we then we move on basically. Yeah. And um, the thing with dermatology is there's almost nothing that's that's FDA approved for these diseases. They're uncommon enough that there's really nothing out there that has an indication for lichen planus. Mm -hmm. So everything's off-label, and right. it's a little bit of experimentation. So mm -hmm. some things I will use, um, and again, in dermatology, you find that a lot of the things we use don't seem like they should work. So probably the first one I start with is actually an antibiotic called mm -hmm. metronidazole. Mm -hmm. um, again, you use it for very different things yeah. than I would use it for, mm -hmm. um, but it's a nice, safe medication in the mm -hmm. realm of things. So I'll start with that. Um, another one is Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine, mm -hmm. so that's a medication we use for lots of different autoimmune diseases mm -hmm. like lupus. Um, and then sometimes we, we work our way through, so there's even been reports that have that Lovenox, which is a blood thinner, has been used in really tiny doses. Yeah, so everything everything is off-label, mm -hmm. basically. And then we get to the, the traditional um, systemic therapies, so mm -hmm. anybody who's has an autoimmune disease will recognize something like yeah. methotrexate yeah. or mycophenolate. Yeah. It's a little bit of a, I start with the things that are safest mm -hmm. and easiest and we work yeah. our way up. A lot of dermatologic conditions that you encounter are have to do with immune system mm -hmm. doing things that it shouldn't do. And yes. so you use those types of drugs a lot, similar things that you might see in a rheumatology office or um, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. which is, um, been really good lately because there has been an explosion mm -hmm. in the amount of medications that we can use. So yeah. not that long ago, because I wasn't in residency that long ago, <laughs> um, but our only options for things like psoriasis, for instance, were right. Enbrel, Stellara, and Humira was just kind of coming out, sure. and now we have it's seemingly unlimited options, so it's a I really exciting time. see them on the television time. all the time. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, yes, I have patients coming in a lot of the time, you know, asking should I be in this one or that one, and there, there's a lot of options, which is really exciting. We mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of safe options before. Yeah, yeah. Um, next question, how can you stop skin tags or prevent them in the first place? So these are an annoyance. You kind of know them when you see them. Yes. Absolutely. Where do people tend to get them? Is it like, is there any contributory factors that people can control? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, the control part is the hard part. Yeah. So, yes, what happens is, as some people are just prone to them, but mm -hmm. as we get older, um, our skin 
loses its elasticity. So the elastic fibers don't stretch and fall back like they should. So instead mm -hmm. of just stretching and going back, they stretch and stay out. So mm -hmm. these tend to show up in areas of friction. So yeah. you know, the sides of our neck, under our arms, mm -hmm. and our groin, those are common areas. Mm -hmm. So there's really, absence not having any friction, there's not a lot of ways to do. So right. sometimes if people are overweight, you know, losing mm -hmm. weight and not having as much friction will help. Mm -hmm. Not wearing really tight clothing in that area will help. Mm -hmm. Um, but otherwise, it's it's a matter of genetics. It's kind yeah. of like people ask me, how do I not get stretch marks? Pick different parents. <laughs> you know, it's, just, <laughs> it's really tricky. Yeah. So some people are just more prone to getting them. Yeah, yeah. And really, removal is sort of cosmetic, or if it's bothersome to you, exactly. it's not a necessary thing typically. No, yeah. not mm -hmm. unless they bother you. So I tell yeah. people, if they hurt or bleed or get caught on things all the time, well, that's a different story. Yeah, but, yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. um, what is bolus pemphigoid, and how can you treat it? So bullous pemphigoid is an autoimmune blistering condition. So what that means is that our, our body is attacking a certain layer in the skin. It's mm -hmm. attacking one of the components that keeps our skin cells together. So instead of our skin just you know holding together and not mm -hmm. being able to be pulled off, our body instead f loses its traction basically and mm -hmm. forms these big blisters in certain areas. Mm -hmm. um, it typically is in older people. So mm -hmm. I see it mostly, I would say, in 70 plus year olds, but mm -hmm. I have seen it in as young as 45, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. Um, and we don't know exactly why that is, whether it's just our body starting to develop this autoimmunity with age or our mm -hmm. waning immune system. We don't know exactly why elderly necessarily mm -hmm. get it. But when it shows up, it can be very devastating. It's very painful. You have mm -hmm. blisters that then open up and they can get infected and it can be a very serious disease. So mm -hmm. we use similar treatments that suppress the immune system. So everything we use is to turn down that autoimmunity. Mm -hmm. Um, again, probably my most common go-to is actually an antibiotic and a B vitamin, so mm -hmm. doxycycline and niacinamide, which again, why they work together is yeah. a little bit of a trick, but yeah. um, again, all the medicines that suppress the immune system is how yeah. we treat it. You, it's interesting, you've mentioned a couple of treatments for diseases that you're right, physiologically, I couldn't put together exactly why those things work. Do you th were these things just stumbled upon at some point in history? Someone took yeah. it for another reason and, oh, look, my skin condition got better. Absolutely, mm -hmm. that's usually how it happens. Because mm -hmm. again, a lot of dermatology diseases, they're orphan diseases. So right. um, th there's nothing approved. There's nothing FDA approved to treat them. And mm -hmm. so it just gets stumbled upon with mm -hmm. time. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, we have a viewer who has had a basal cell carcinoma removed and they say the scar is still very irritable. Could you comment on why that is or if anything might be done for that patient? Yeah, so it, it depends on kind of what's making it irritable. So mm -hmm. the first year after you remove something on the skin, that scar is still maturing. Mm -hmm. So it can get big, it can get thick, and then it does usually itch. Mm -hmm. So if I see patients back and their, their scar is overgrown or what we call hyper, hypertrophic scar, mm -hmm. Then there's things we can do. We can inject it with steroids and try to get it to flatten down and not be so irritated. If it's irritating because it's causing bulging or different areas on the skin, mm. then usually I wait about a year again for that scar to mature, um, and then we can revise that scar. So if there's extra tissue in one area or the other, we mm -hmm. can remove it. So just it kind of depends on uh, why it's irritating. The biggest thing is you just want to make sure you're having skin checks to right. make sure that that's not a recurrent not a skin cancer. Of, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just make sure it's just the scar and not that that sure. skin cancer is coming back. Yeah. So probably talk to the person who absolutely. removed it for you. Absolutely. Huh? Um, what causes rosacea and how do you treat it? That's maybe one of the more the common things yeah. that that we see um, as far as a skin condition. It's very visible to people because it usually occurs on the face, right? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. As I can feel the warmth in here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so um, rosacea is, is a little bit interesting. It, we consider it, a again, an inflammatory condition. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing more and more now, kind of like psoriasis, that people with rosacea have underlying inflammation in their body. So people with rosacea actually are at higher risk for things like cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So we think it's the same, so, same sort of thing, some sort of inflammatory condition. Mm -hmm. There's three different types, so it depends on what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. the, the first type is just the flushing, the easy flushing, mm -hmm. the background redness, the, the red blood vessels. Those are harder to treat, actually. So mm -hmm. those, we don't have a lot of options. We tell mm -hmm. people to look for triggers with their foods. So mm -hmm. um, common triggers are caffeine, alcohol, mm -hmm. spicy foods, mm -hmm. hot foods, just temperature hot foods. Yeah. Anything that's gonna make you flush, the more you do it, the, the more those blood vessels are gonna stay open and stay red for mm -hmm. you. Then we get into different types that where you actually get almost pimply bumps on, mm -hmm. your, on your cheeks. Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually on the cheeks, nose, forehead, mm -hmm. chin. 
those we can use different creams to treat or pills to treat. So. Mm -hmm that there's a lot more options for. Mm -hmm. um, the last type is something called rhinophimitis. So that's when, if you've ever seen people that get the, the big nose, mm -hmm. that, that's from rosacea. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing I want to mention is that you've got to also have ocular rosacea, so rosacea in your eyes. So mm -hmm. I see a lot of patients that have really dry eyes and burning eyes all the time, and that's a result of their rosacea. So oftentimes I work with my local ophthalmologist, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to, to coordinate care because they interplay a lot. Okay. Um, but lots of topical treatments. Absolutely, yeah. That's effective usually for rosacea. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is an this is a rare disease. What is the treatment for systemic mastocytosis? <laughs> well, <laughs> I can tell you this is not a common disorder. Yeah. So um, I actually have a patient with mm -hmm. this. Um, so it, it depends on what stage again. So when I see mastocytosis, it's usually cutaneous mastocytosis, mm -hmm. obviously. So mastocytosis is an overgrowth of a type of cell mm -hmm. called a mast cell. Um, and we, I, we like to think of it as kind of the allergy or hive cell. Right. So anytime they get activated, our skin puffs up, gets mm -hmm. red. That's what happens in our skin. Mm -hmm. In our body, we can have problems like you know, throat swelling, um, headache, mm -hmm. flushing, nausea, diarrhea, mm -hmm. um, headaches, all of that. Yeah. So. It, de it depends. So when it's once it gets systemic, I'm usually out of it. You know, once I once I see it, that it's on their skin and I'm suspicious that it's also in, internally, yeah. I send them to oncology. So it's a hematology oncology yeah. problem, mm -hmm. um, and then they they work at turning off the production of those cells. So mm -hmm. it's it's immunosuppressants that work in the bone marrow. So yeah. I wouldn't be the best one to talk about what <laughs> systemic <laughs> cutaneous. Our, yeah. our next uh, our next question is related. Um, how do you stop chronic hives? So a, a similar process. Yes, right, absolutely. both yep. related to histamine release, yep. we think. Mm -hmm. So hi hives are probably one of my, my frustrating <laughs> diagnoses because mm -hmm. everyone wants to know why, which first of all, we almost never discover why. Yeah. People so, are surprised about that, yes. you know, people come in with, they've had oh, hives yes. for a week and think that allergy testing is going to yeah. be helpful, but in, in a high percentage of cases, we never find exactly. the reason for hives or urticaria. Exactly, mm -hmm. yep. If I, if I say, so a chronic urticaria is over six weeks. Mm -hmm. So acute urticaria, I say, you know, it's, it was a virus, it was a medicine, we can mm -hmm. sometimes find something. But if you've had hives for more than six weeks, unless there's some other symptom going on, I usually don't check lab work. And yeah. I usually tell people, you know, I could waste a million dollars of your money and we're never going to find it, so let's, yeah. let's not go there. Yeah. The first step is antihistamines, so mm -hmm. high dose antihistamines, and we work our way up on those. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's kind of the mainstay of treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and then we add different things in that we kind of use for allergies or asthma, so things sure. like singular, different sort of acid reducer medications. Sure. And then eventually we can even get to, again, immunosuppressants, things okay. that turn down the immune system. Mm -hmm. And now there actually is a an injectable medication that's approved for chronic urticaria. So I see I see steroids used in urticaria a lot, and and probably not a lot of good evidence that that is effective treatment. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it will take care of them, but they'll come right back, and yeah. so you end up kind of a little bit on this roller coaster. So mm -hmm. I really try to avoid using steroids if mm -hmm. I can. And again, it's it's very hard. It it's very hard it to hold it. Feel yes. Better. It's yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. What are some common treatments for teenage acne, and is Accutane still one of them? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, teenage acne. So it it kind of helps understand how acne works. So the first step in acne is that pore clogs and then the oil builds up underneath there and then when that oil spills out under the skin our skin doesn't like it so it gets inflamed and angry mm -hmm. and so I use things that uh, kind of attack each step of those so the first thing is a retinoid mm -hmm. so a retinoid is a, a cream and, or a pill which is Accutane mm -hmm. that helps prevent the clogging of the pore and the buildup of the oil mm -hmm. so most of them are prescription there actually is one over the counter now which is mm -hmm. Differin gel okay. um, and so that's the best thing for a retinoid to help prevent mm -hmm. that clogging then we attack the inflammation part of it. So how we typically do that is with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times in the past we would put people on you know, oral antibiotics for years at a time. I say mm -hmm. we, not since I've been in practice. <laughs> um, but now we really keep it. We know that's not good antibiotic stewardship. Mm -hmm. We worry about antibiotic resistance and we know that doctors have created a lot of that. And mm -hmm. so I really, I, I only use those for a couple of months, if mm -hmm. that, um, but we do use topical antibiotics. Mm -hmm. um, and then hormonally, so f with females, there are lots of different hormonal options, mm -hmm. and we often will attack that. With guys, it's a little bit trickier. There's not a lot of, sure. you know, if I could give every guy estrogen, it would take care of their acne, but they wouldn't they like that wouldn't very like much. That. No, not very them, much. Yeah. Um, but Accutane, honestly, is, is my f favorite medicine to use in dermatology. It just works. It works every time. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. So um, it 
I, I've never had a patient regret it, and I, I've changed people's lives, so that's my mm -hmm. favorite medicine to use. And Accutane, oncology. probably a lot of people know someone who has yeah. been on Accutane. Tell us about sort of the dangers and monitoring. Yes. It's highly, it's kind of highly regulated. It I is. can't prescribe Accutane yes, if someone came is. into my clinic, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, so yeah, there's a whole government program mm -hmm. that you have to sign up for to be able to prescribe it. And it's because if, if you're a female of reproductive age and you got pregnant on Accutane, it got, does cause very severe birth defects. Yeah. So that's the real reason it's controlled so mm -hmm. tightly. Um, it's it's interesting because that medication has gone out of your system in a week, you know, and the government controls it so tightly. There's a cousin called acetretin that stays in your system for three years that the government does not control. So it's not really logical, yeah. <laughs> um, but that's what we're bound by. Yeah. So the biggest thing is the birth defects. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then it can affect your liver, mm -hmm. can affect your cholesterol. Mm -hmm. um, and the big controversy over, over Accutane has always been mood swings and mood side effects. Mm -hmm. That really has been kind of debunked over time. Mm -hmm. um, it, as with a lot of skin disorders, Patients with acne have a very high rate of depression and anxiety mm -hmm. just having the acne. Mm -hmm. Just like if you would have eczema or psoriasis, it's a very emotional mm -hmm. thing. So we know that it's actually that that's causing the mood swings and mood changes, not the medicine used to treat it. So Interesting, yeah. yeah. Um, one more question before we go to a patient video. I have breakouts from discoid lupus and get two shots a year for it. Should I be getting more shots? Um, it I guess it depends if you mean um, like shots in the actual discoid lupus areas, which is usually what I do. So I inject mm -hmm. steroids directly into the areas of discoid lupus. Mm -hmm. if, if two shots control it, then that's fine. But yeah. I usually, um, over a certain dose, then we worry about it actually absorbing into your body and causing problems internally. So I will keep it to a certain dose that I will give once a month. Mm -hmm. So I usually see my patients once a month and inject what they have. But mm -hmm. if if it only it's needs very to be, yeah, it's very individualized. Yeah. So yeah, it Got just it. depends on if it's controlled. Good, okay. Ideally, once a treatment is started, healing begins, but sometimes that healing gets worse before it gets better. I had a number of precancerous skin lesions um, and both on my face and on my scalp, um, predominantly along the temples, cheeks, and on, on my scalp. Well, I was in the in the exam room about in early September and she had looked at my chart the previous from the previous year and told me that she had sprayed the liquid nitrogen about 20 times and that that was too many and she wanted to go the route of using Effudex. I had one spot right here that about starting about two months prior to the treatment it was uh, kind of a crusty and that's the only one that I really had with, with that indication on it. I applied the Effudex twice a day roughly 12 hours apart on the cheeks, temples and on my scalp and then waited about an hour and then uh, coated it with the light uh, coating of Vaseline and then went through it again in the evening. The first two days wasn't too bad um, by the application, fourth application, so the evening of the second day, I could tell where the sunspots were when I applied it by the amount that it burned on those particular areas in comparison to the other skin. My skin just progressively uh, got redder um, and, and I applied that for five days, twice a day for five days. And probably on day four of application of it, I started getting some bleeding and some oozing, especially on my cheeks here, and a little bit on, on the temple, but not as bad. When I was done with the five days of, of treatment, uh, it really got worse as that week progressed. Actually, it got probably at its worst about five to six days after I stopped treatment. And then it started getting slowly healing, and slowly is probably, actually it healed reasonably quickly in comparison, because. I would have used the last treatment on January 13th, and today's the 28th, so roughly two weeks. And for the most part, my, hands, my skin is healed. Um, you can still see a little bit of pink there, uh, light, light sunburn, and they say that'll take about one to two months, and then skin should look normal. I did use sunscreen religiously once it became available and useful, and by useful I mean something that really worked, but they also tell you that the damage that we see now at I'm 67 was done when I was young, you know, a kid. So 
you know, here we are 50 years later, 60 years later, and seeing the results. I think it's too early to tell that one spot I was talking about earlier, that's no longer there. So going by that, um, hopefully I don't have to do this again. This is your program and your questions are key to the direction of our discussion. Call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. Back with Mandy Greenway. We've gotten a few questions on uh, sort of a different train of topic, which would be some in infectious causes of skin problems. Um, the first one would be about warts. So warts are something that are pretty common. The question we got is why do warts sometimes grow back even after they're treated? Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about warts? Absolutely, mm -hmm. so warts are caused by um, a virus called the human papillomavirus. There are about 100 different strains of warts. So um, usually we get exposed to kind of the common wart viruses in our childhood um, and then we start to make warts and then eventually our immune system kind of figures it out and mm -hmm. we stop making them. Um, why warts come back? So usually the deal is that you didn't get it all the first time. Mm -hmm. So when patients come to me for warts, I tell them up front that we're looking at probably three to five treatments to, to get rid of these spots mm -hmm. and sometimes more. Mm -hmm. um, it just depends on how big they are and how long they've been there mm -hmm. um, and kind of where they're at. So mm -hmm. if, if they're truly gone, they should be gone in that spot. But again, once the virus is in our system, it's kind of always there. So you could get a new one. Um, so when I treat warts, I like to treat things that destroy the wart, mm -hmm. but also try to get our immune system to recognize the wart virus. Okay. And there's mm -hmm. different ways to do that. Yeah. Do so you have some wart pictures do, and yeah. um, what might be characteristic? Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. this is um, a, a common wart. So you can see there it's just like a skin colored little bump there mm -hmm. um, and it has these kind of um, projections over the top of it usually. Um, mm -hmm. People often d discuss seeing like the little black dots and call them the, you know, the root of mm -hmm. the wart. What that is is actually little blood vessels mm -hmm. um, in the wart that are, that are closed off and so mm -hmm. they, um, they close off and they're no longer red, they're black yeah. now. So that's the little black dots we mm -hmm. see when warts are there. So that's mm -hmm. a common wart. Um, then I also have an example of something called flat warts. Mm -hmm. um, flat warts are as they sound like. Mm -hmm. um, oh, next one if you can. Maybe? There we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as they sound like they're they're flat. So mm -hmm. oftentimes they're really hard to, to diagnose actually because sometimes they're really, really subtle. Sure. These are really common in kids. Mm -hmm. um, you can see on, on that child's upper lip there, mm -hmm. um, there's a line of warts. And often that happens if we pick at them or scratch sure. them, they can spread in that area. Mm -hmm. So I often tell people, you know, try not to pick at your warts, try mm -hmm. not to touch them, cut them, all of those right. things. So Because right. there is virus in those yes. cells, correct? Absolutely, yep. Um, what's the nat like natural history of warts? So yeah. if someone comes, they've got a wart maybe in a place on their foot and mm -hmm. it's not cosmetically bothersome to them, what can I tell them about a wart? Yeah, so oftentimes mm -hmm. warts will go away on their own because again, yeah. eventually our immune system figures it out, fights mm -hmm. it off and goes away. Um, and so I'll, I'll offer that, you know, mm -hmm. if it doesn't bother you, if it's not in a spot that yeah. bothers you all the time, it's not causing pain, we don't have to do anything. Right. Um, but it, when they do start to spread and you get more of them mm -hmm. or in an area that you're self-conscious of, you know, yeah. I have a lot of patients that don't want to shake hands, you know, because they have sure. warts on their hands. Yeah. Then it's worth doing some treatments mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. Um, and there is a vaccine for Absolutely, HPV. Yes. This is a relatively new. I mean, in the in the in the realm of things, this was just Absolutely. approved probably around the time we were in medical school or shortly before. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's it's been really exciting. So the mm -hmm. HPV vaccine now is a, a nine valent, as, mm -hmm. as you're aware. Um, so nine different strains of of the wart virus mm -hmm. or the HPV virus. Um, what's really exciting about it, and we actually started doing this work in residency, was that. Uh, it's in trials um, and studies have shown that if you get the HPV vaccine, some of your resistant warts that have mm -hmm. been stubborn will actually, can actually go away. Um, and so I actually have a couple of patients right now that I'm, I'm actually injecting the, the HPV vaccine directly into their warts. Oh, interesting. Um, which is not very comfortable for them, <laughs> um, but seeing some improvement. Um, mm -hmm. So it's in studies and I, I actually predict that it will be mm -hmm eventually approved yeah. for actually treatment of resistant warts. And every few years we hear that the the population for which HPV is mm -hmm. approved 
is widening, widening. So it used to be sort of a narrow, um, small age group of girls only. I think, was it 11 to 26 was the original indication, yeah. and then it expanded to boys, and now we're seeing that probably it, it, it could possibly benefit even people as they get older. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right now it's approved up to 45, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, and so I have a lot of my patients that will come in with, you know, adults that have had warts for years and years yeah. and it's clear they're not going away and, and now we can actually get them that HPV vaccine. Yeah. So yeah. it's really exciting. Okay. Um, we also got a question on how do you treat molluscum contagiosum in kids? Kind of a yeah. similar, so, somewhat similar in, a, in appearance. Absolutely. Um, so I have a picture of that mm -hmm. as well. Um, so it's also caused by a virus um, mm -hmm. called the molluscum contagiosum virus. Um, it is a bunch of little pink bumps and they often have a little white bump, um, like a little white part in the middle of them. Mm -hmm. um, can you the picture pulled up? So they're very common, spread by contact. Um, yeah, spread by contact. So I see a lot, you know, oh, brother, sister had them, and picture. then, mm -hmm. and then, you know, now I have a whole bunch of them. Again, these also sometimes go away on their own. So if there's mm -hmm. just a couple and they don't bother kids, I sometimes will just let them be. Mm -hmm. um, but once they start to spread a lot, that can cause problems. So yeah. the easiest way um, is usually using a. Um, a little liquid, actually, I call it blister beetle juice. Mm -hmm. It's called cantharone. Um, but you put a little dab <laughs> a on there. A sweet name. To I tell know. A kid, yes. A kid you're putting on their yes. Skin. So it's actually from a beetle. <laughs> That's its defense mechanism. That if you bite that beetle, it causes a blister. Mm -hmm. So um, you put a little dab on, and then mm -hmm. you put a bandaid over the top, and then they form a little blister, and then mm -hmm. they go away. Yeah. Um, there are other ways. Again, trying to get your immune system to recognize it. So sometimes mm -hmm. I'll actually use an acne cream mm -hmm. that makes the skin a little bit dry and irritated, and yeah. that triggers the immune system. So. Yeah. A lot of times what I'll see or I'll have people say is that these, as they're going away, they actually get really red and irritated and they often will look infected. Oh. So people think they're infected, but that's actually our immune response. Yeah. Recognizing them sure. means they're gonna go away, so. Good. Um, so another, kind of another infection question, interestingly, they're clustered mm -hmm. together. How many times can you get shingles and is there a way to prevent them when you're too young to get vaccinated? So we do have a vaccine and we have a new vaccine that's actually much more effective at least in the older patients that I see than the old vaccine was but it is only approved for adults over 50 and we know that shingles does happen in younger patients so Absolutely. what do we know about shingles and why people tend to get outbreaks yeah so usually what happens um, well first of all you have to have the chicken pox to get shingles mm -hmm. so that's another reason to get your chicken pox vaccination because mm -hmm. then you will, won't get shingles so mm -hmm. I know that wasn't an option for us mm -hmm. when we were young mm -hmm. um, but, so you have to have ch chicken pox and then it comes out in one area. Mm -hmm. You can get it again. So yeah. I have personally had it twice. <laughs> um, and usually it's, you know, when it comes out, it's that your your immune system is under stress for some reason, mm -hmm. or it's just gone down. So that's why it tends to happen in older age. Yeah. I, I personally, again, I was in middle school when I had shingles and yeah. the doctors were very puzzled. And right. I, otherwise normally fine healthy right. um, and then the second time I had it was in medical school studying for one of our big tests I had another outbreak of it so mm -hmm. it can happen it's uncommon but again if your immune system doesn't have enough antibodies to it mm -hmm. it can kind of wane enough and then you get it again so yeah. that's another reason even if people have had shingles before you can still get the shingles shot yeah because again it, it in fact I recommend it I, I probably if you've had shingles once you're more likely than someone who's never had shingles to get another episode exactly. so it's a good reason to get it it doesn't make you immune to to getting it again no. like you might think yes mm -hmm. exactly but I don't know that I could give advice on to things that you could do to prevent no. it it can occur at random I mean we say it's absolutely. under stressful times but I feel like a lot of cases do kind of happen bad luck absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, okay interesting question here so the body does most things for a good reason like has coughs and sneezes and pain you could think of a physiologic reason for those things but why do we itch is there an evolutionary mechanism for question. itching that anybody has purported yeah well it's it's um the same sort of reason we have pain actually mm -hmm. so some nerve fibers send out pain some send out itch mm -hmm. and so a lot of times it's alerting us to something that's going on our skin. I mean, you think about a mosquito bite. We're, we're saying, hey, there, yeah. there's a bug there. You know, if we never itched for mosquito bites, we probably wouldn't shoo them off, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of times I'll, I'll see that where if somebody has, say, a pinched nerve in their neck or their shoulder, it can relay itch to the skin. Um, and mm -hmm. so I see that a lot. So it's just like pain. It's alerting us that something is going on yeah. in our skin usually. Good. Um, 
how can you tell which moles are cancerous? We touched a little bit about this early in the show, but can you touch again quickly on the main features? Yeah, absolutely. So the again, the, the ABCDEs are what mm -hmm. we think of. So um, and again, my general rule of thumb is if you take any mole and you would cut it in half in any direction, mm -hmm. it should be the same from side to side. Mm -hmm. So same color, same border, same shape, mm -hmm. and it should look like the rest of the moles on your body. So mm -hmm. if it looks like no other mole on there, it definitely should be checked. Mm -hmm. The other hard part is that when we use the word mole, it means a lot of things to right. a lot of different people. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, most, uh, I mean, obviously people have a lot of moles, but I would say if people come in and say this mole is changing, it usually isn't a mole, actually. So sure. that's a good thing to talk about is yeah. the most common um, spot that I would say people come in and talk to me about yeah. is something called seborrheic keratosis. Mm -hmm. um, that is a, a brown spot that mm -hmm. shows up on our skin, um, and they can be flat or they can be raised and crusty like this. Mm -hmm. Here's an example of a flat one there. Yeah. And those, so those are completely different cells. Yeah. Um, those have nothing to do with melanocytes, mm -hmm. which which is what causes a mole. Mm -hmm. And those ones can break all the rules. Yeah. So that makes it really tricky. Is, you it know, does, and it just yeah. kind of takes a discerning eye. Exactly. I mean, I see these all the time in, our, in my clinic, and it's pretty easy to you know, if you've seen them enough before, reassure somebody exactly. without biopsying every seborrheic keratosis that walks through the door. Exactly, yeah. But you so, just have to ask, right? Exactly, yeah. that's why I tell people, mm -hmm. I, I don't expect my patients yeah. to know, that's why you're in my office. So yeah. if, if there's a brown spot that's changing, mm -hmm. um, hurting, bleeding, doesn't look like the rest of your spots, it should be checked out. It should be looked. Yes. But there are, yes, this, this is a great example of mm -hmm. something that can grow, change, mm -hmm. look kind of ugly, yes. and it's benign. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other examples of common benign moles yeah. that um, we could yeah, I do. review some so features of? So this is a picture of just a normal, what I would call an intradermal nevus. So mm -hmm. what happens usually is our moles start out kind of flat and dark, mm -hmm. um, and then as, as they age, the mole cells go a little bit deeper in the skin and kind of get raised up and then start to lose its color. So you can see in this one, there's not very much pigment left there. There's mm -hmm. only a little bit of brown spots there. So that is a totally normal mole. So you can mm -hmm. see there, it's it's symmetric. It's the same color throughout. Mm -hmm. um, the edges are smooth. Looks totally normal. Yeah. So yeah. that guy's fine. Mm -hmm. um, I know you had. Do you have some hemangiomas or cherry hemangiomas? Yeah. These are also very common. Absolutely. Um, so these are something called cherry angiomas, or people call them cherry moles or red moles. So this is actually a little collection of blood vessels underneath the surface of the skin. Very common. So most people will get them at some point in their life, but it does run in families how many you get. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we do get more birthdays, we get more of them. So mm -hmm. um, they're common in the trunk. I'll see them yeah. all the time. Yep. Yeah. Um, Touching on those seborrheic keratosis, we had a question, how can you prevent waxy keratosis, which is, mm -hmm. I assume is what they're talking about, and granulomas, or how should I remove them? Would you recommend mm -hmm. that someone try to self-remove a seborrheic keratosis at home? Yeah, well, yes and no. So um, <laughs> there is no way to prevent them, unfortunately. Yeah. Again, it, it's also that it runs in families. So mm -hmm. I tell people, look at your mom, dad, grandpa, grandma. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of them, you're gonna have a lot of them. Yeah. Um, and again, they just, as you, as you get older, they're gonna you're gonna get more of them. Mm -hmm. um, lots of lotion, and specifically lotion that has a mild acid in it. So mm -hmm. things like amlactin um, or urea cream, those can help keep them smoother. So they're gonna be more okay. like the flat brown spots um, than the raised ones. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, you know, there'll still be colored spots there. Mm -hmm. I do sometimes recommend things for people to get rid of them at home, but again, that's if they're seborrheic keratosis. So I sure you always want to go out of exactly yes. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. not a good idea to just try to go freezing off brown spots on your body unless you know exactly what they are. Sure, so should be checked out first, but then there yeah. are things we can talk about. Yeah. Okay. Um, is it true that if hair is growing out of a mole, then it is not cancerous? Good question. So. Um, Hair is, is an advanced kind of evolutionary thing. So we think of, you know, if, if something is growing hair, it means it's behaving like it should be in general. However, so about, about half of melanomas develop in a mole that was already there. Sure. Um, and then it's, it goes bad, basically. Mm -hmm. And so that mole that was normal usually has a hair growing in it. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a long time for that mole to be completely taken over and lose its hair. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, it's not a, it's good, not a rule. It's not a rule, by. exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay. 
um, are moles on the scalp and hair area bad? Is there anything different yeah. about the scalp or hair? No. Just that it's harder to examine. Exactly, <laughs> yep, so that's actually a good point. That's mm -hmm. the same reason people think that moles on your hands and your feet are more dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, because if they turn into melanoma, we often don't catch them as early. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that the moles themselves are any more dangerous. So yeah, it, yeah they're, it's not that they're more dangerous, it's just hard to follow. Just them. harder to see. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us about, so if, if you diagnose someone with a skin cancer, and maybe it depends on the type of skin cancer, do you just send them back to their, their family doc for skin checks, or do you recommend closer monitoring, right? Someone who's had a melanoma is more likely to have risk for another melanoma, correct? Exactly, yeah. yep. So even um, basal cell and squamous cell, mm -hmm. so within the first year of diagnosis, the, within the next three years, you're more likely to have another skin cancer. Um, and I often tell people it's, it's all about your comfort level, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, it depends how many skin checks you do. It's not that primary care couldn't do that job, it's that your job is very hard. You have a lot of things in that visit yeah. um, to manage, and mm -hmm. skin checks are not always one of them. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, you know, if it's prohibitive to get to a dermatologist, if you can't get to me, I you know, encourage you to at least make a dedicated visit for your skin check yeah. and not lump it in with all of the other problems that yeah. primary care has, to, has yeah. to do in a visit. So. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a challenging thing when a patient comes in and I might be talking about their five chronic diseases with them and then, oh yeah, also, yeah. do you think you could take this mole off for me? It's not, it's not quite so simple. It, it's, exactly. it's a little bit challenging to work into yeah. um, a clinic schedule. So it's not a bad, never a bad idea if you're thinking about it to just make a dedicated visit it to ask about your skin things. Absolutely. Um, why do adults get acne and should they, what, what should they do? We talked about treatment of teenage acne yeah. before. Is it different for adults in any way? It is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, first thing is we, we all expect that when we, once we become adults, we're not gonna have acne anymore, which is not the case actually, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, about 30% of, of women in their 30s have acne, so it lasts much longer than adolescents. Um, and I have patients in their 50s on Accutane. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily that you're gonna grow out of it. So mm -hmm. I always will tell patients that, that you know, it's, it's not a waiting game. I can't promise you it's gonna be gone in a year. Um, adults have acne for the same reason teenagers have acne. Mm -hmm. um, our hormones don't go away necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and if we have the genetic predisposition for how our oil glands act and how, how sticky our skin is, you know, mm -hmm. how, how likely we are to form that clogged pore, mm -hmm. um, it is just, different factors. Mm -hmm. um, we're also seeing a lot more of our skin microbiome play a role. So mm -hmm. we hear a lot about our gut microbiome and yeah. good bacteria versus bad bacteria. And, and we're, seeing a, we're seeing a lot more research on that actually in dermatology. Yeah. Um, it, as far as skin Not diseases. Surprising. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, like acne and, and eczema especially mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of role for that now. So yeah. again, just a different microbiome can contribute to yeah. that as well. Okay. Time for one more quick question. What are your thoughts on treating rosacea with a laser? Absolutely, mm -hmm. so if it's the type of rosacea that's just the background redness or dilated blood vessels, that is the best treatment for rosacea. So I do that every day in my practice. Mm -hmm. So um, the downside is, you know, I can get it cleared up, but it's not a permanent cure. You know, if you continue to flush and be exposed to the things that are triggers for mm -hmm. you, it can happen again. So I have a lot of patients that'll come in once a year to have you know a series of a couple of laser treatments to get it controlled for mm -hmm. them, but then they might be back in another year or two to have yeah. that done, but yeah. very safe, effective. Yeah, and laser is used for a multitude of reasons Absolutely. in a dermatology practice um, for, for, for those things, so. Okay. Yep. Um, we, you mentioned eczema. Yeah. This is a common time of year to Absolutely. see eczema. Everything's dry. What's the first thing that you recommend for people with maybe yeah. more mild eczema? So Vaseline, Vaseline, I was gonna say it, right? right. My That's friends me. laugh at me so much. <laughs> they always ask me for my beauty tips. I'm like, Vaseline. Dry skin, eczema, yes, cake on everything. the Vaseline, says Absolutely. Dr. Greenway. Yes. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. The most common skin cancer is A, squamous cell carcinoma, B, malignant melanoma, C, basal cell carcinoma. The answer is C, basal cell carcinoma. In the US alone, more than four million cases are diagnosed each year. Basal cell carcinomas arise from abnormal, uncontrolled growth of basal cells. It was Michelle Nelson from Sioux Falls who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Michelle, for participating, and a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. 
Extra Extra Read the Prairie Doc Perspectives weekly column in your local newspaper. More than 100 newspapers in the region print the newspaper column written by Dr. Rick Holm, covering a variety of medical and health-related topics. Ask your local paper if they carry the Prairie Doc Perspectives. It's the dead of winter, and who among us isn't craving the feeling of warm sunshine on our skin? I, for one, am dreaming of summer days spent outdoors, not a care in the world, basking in that delicious ultraviolet light. But alas, I must be my own physician buzzkill and remind myself that there is more to those rays than the pure delight I'm romanticizing. The truth is there is technically no safe amount of UV exposure when it comes to our skin and the risk of skin cancer. One in five of us will have a skin cancer diagnosed in our lifetimes. And while many types of skin cancer are not life-threatening, some are. Melanoma in particular is a skin cancer with great potential to metastasize and ultimately take lives. Like other skin cancers, ultraviolet exposure is a major risk factor for melanoma. I can recall one summer day when I was 13, I fell asleep on a July day watching a cousin play baseball. My fair skin back was exposed to the sun unprotected, leaving me horrendously sunburned in the days that followed. I will never forget those next few days, one of which I spent carrying my golf bag on a hot, humid tournament day, my back covered in blisters. The thought of it is now enough to make me cringe. And let's not forget, it doesn't have to be a hot summer day to incur skin damage. Many of us have been surprised with a sunburn sustained while skiing or ice fishing. Sun is sun, whether the temperature is hot or cold. And even on a cloudy day, those UV rays make it down to earth. And don't get me or your friendly dermatologist started on the risks posed by tanning beds. Protecting one's skin from the sun is something we can all do to stay healthier. There are a variety of ways to do this. Avoiding sun entirely or staying in the shade, wearing protective clothing like long sleeves, pants, and a wide brimmed hat, physical sunscreen like zinc oxide, or chemical sunscreen. The experts recommend at least SPF 30 applied every two hours. I still love summer. I love being outside for hours, sweating in the sun. But these days, you'll find me with the SPF 50 applied before I leave the house and carried along at all times for reapplication. Big thank you to Mandy Greenway for volunteering to come to our studio in Yeager Hall on the campus of South Dakota State University and adding her experience and knowledge to our discussion tonight. If you would like more information about this program or to see more episodes, please like and follow us on Facebook or visit us at prairie.org. Still time to get your flu shot. It's important not just for you, but to help protect those around you. That does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. One of our favorite topics, we'll tackle whatever you would like to know about, medically that is. Ask anything, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. For more than a decade, Dr. Holm, in his role as the Prairie Doc, has emerged as a leader of healthcare education and communication in South Dakota and across the country. Every week, Dr. Holm and other medical professionals volunteer many hours to share science-based truth about healthcare on public television, on the radio, in our newspapers, and online. And best of all, everyone has free, easy access to the entire Prairie Doc Library. Hi, I'm Jennifer May of Rapid City. As a board member of the Healing Words Foundation, I ask you to consider making a donation. 
please help us continue this important work. Go to prairiedoc.org and make a donation today. Thank you. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by. Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Urology Specialists, Brown Clinic, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Black Hills Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Flandreau Madison Brookings District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physician Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, and Swift Hell Communications.